Boa tarde a todos. Bem-vindos ao quarto seminário científico do NAP Genômica. Antes de apresentar a nossa palestrante do dia, eu gostaria de deixar alguns recados aqui em português, antes de a gente mudar a nossa língua, o inglês. Esse é o nosso último seminário de 2021. É, a gente vai voltar, então, com seminários no dia 28 de janeiro de 2022, com a presença do médico hematologista Rodrigo Calado. Ele é atualmente diretor científico da Fundação Hemocentro de Ribeirão Preto. Então, a gente vai mandar para vocês mais informações mais próximas. Então, só lembrando, esse é o último encontro. Teremos, então, a continuidade a partir do ano que vem, da última sexta-feira de janeiro de 2022. So, I'm pleased to announce and introduce today's speaker, Julius Professor for Molecular Head and Neck Oncology in the University Hospital of Cologne, in Germany, at the Department of Translational Genomics. Julie has broad experience with single cell RNA and DNA sequencing, trying to understand the pathogenesis and evolution of lung cancer under chemotherapy and immunotherapy, with a specific focus on histological subgroups of small cell lung cancer. I had the opportunity to work with Julie during my time in Germany, and I'm pleased to continue in collaboration with her and other researchers. Julie, thank you very much again for accepting the invitation to this talk. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, please send them in the chat so I can so I can ask at the end. Julie, please feel free to start and thanks again. All right, great. I will do so. Um you do hear me right now, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um I think I'm also sharing my screen and I will start very shortly. Thank you first Carlos for inviting me to this uh, lecture series. This of course hard. It's online. I don't see anyone. We do, do see you and it's a great honor to be part of this lecture series and to present uh, the work that we're doing. Um, I will start sharing my screen and I hope you do see that now, right? Um, yeah. Yeah? Okay, good. Then I will start. Um, yes, so again, as, as Carlos just introduced, um, I'm, I'm in working at the Department of Translational Genomics here in Germany at the University Hospital of Cologne. And one of the major focus I've been having in the last years was to work specifically on lung cancer to apply large scale sequencing uh, approaches to study the cancer and the tumor microenvironment and uh, to understand more about the genomic cues, but also how the genomic cues uh, translate to um, the molecular profiles in these tumors. And um, in my talk today, I will display uh, the work that we've been doing in the last years mainly starting first with genome sequencing, but also with the advent of single cell technologies, which are all very exciting, that I've been also collaborating with, with Carlos. Um, we, I'm also going to dive into the approaches that we're taking to do single cell analyses. Um, as understood, um, this lecture series is very broad. Um, there are several layers of expertise, um, and the focus that we are having is, uh, is on, on cancer, specifically in lung cancer. Um, these are, I will start off with, a, with an overview of the most common cancers, the incidence rates and the mortality rate worldwide, as um, determined by the IARC uh, Cancer Today statistics from 2018. So worldwide, we have 18 million cases diagnosed yearly, 9 million people die every year of cancer, and lung cancer is um, one of the cancers with the highest incidence rate and the highest mortality rate. Um, so. Although it's always uh, related to smoking related as um, um, use or tobacco uh, usage, a lot of cancer types, specifically in the lung, are also affected by other environmental cues and there's a great need to understand um, what is going on in these, for these patients. Um, so this is a very general overview on how usually patients with cancer are treated. Um, the most optimal solution is if there's a surgery at the time of first diagnosis, if, if it's resectable. The tumor is taken out, and actually that's the best cure so far, I would say, that is available. But if it's not um, resectable, if the resection is not possible, it's chemotherapy and radiation that is applied to the patients. And um, the hope is that uh, these, these uh, systemic therapies uh, allow us for a shrinkage of a tumor. Um, with lung cancer, um, chemotherapy and radiation is often now, nowadays combined with immune checkpoint inhibitors, which shows some, some better efficacies in patients. Um, but then, uh, unfortunately, that leads to relapse. Second, third-line therapies are uh, applied, and um, the, the, the other options are then further treatment options are very restricted. So it is very unclear on how to further proceed. 
So the need is to identify me mechanisms that drive cancer and uh, also to find a better targeted therapies based on the molecular mechanisms that drive cancer types to then um, come up with better therapeutic strategies. So this is um, a very broad overview of what has been done so far in lung cancer. And um, over the last uh, 30 years almost, um, more and more genes have been identified and which seem to contribute or were found to be contributing to lung cancer, starting from KRAS in 1984 to, uh, to other genes um, or targetable genes uh, that have been uh, discovered from the year 2000 up to 2010. And this was all before uh, using next generation sequencing techniques. This was just uh, understanding more about the cancer biology of certain genes. And the difficulty was always to pick the right gene and to understand what is the contribution of that gene in the specific cancer type. Now with the advent of next generation sequencing in the past decade, um, there, a lot has been uh, done. We've done a lot of lung cancer genomes. Uh, the first genomes of uh, lung cancers were, were determined more genomic, uh, tractable, uh, therapeutically um, addressable uh, uh, mutations or alterations were found. And the difficulty was is really nowadays to find the relevant genes among all the genes that we find altered or, or changed. So uh, large-scale uh, genome and molecular profiling studies have been performed to identify oncogenic drivers and therapeutic uh, vulnerabilities. This is a pie chart for lung cancer. Um, the most frequent lung cancers are adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas that account for most lung cancer types. And we have small cell lung cancer, which is belonging to a subgroup of neuroendocrine carcinomas, which further includes also large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas and carcinoids. And um, what, what has been done so far, or what are therapeutic options in the past years? A lot of receptor tyrosine kinase alterations were found in adenocarcinomas. Um, EGFR mutations, ARC, RED, ROS, NTRAC, NRG1 fusions and translocations, but also amplification events. And most recently, GTPase inhibitors for KRAS uh, mutations were applied. And these options all allow for a better targeted therapy in these case cases with adenocarcinomas. For squamous cell carcinomas, FGFR1 amplifications were found, and that allow also for targets and for treatments. And as Carlos has pointed out, the focus I had in the last years was to work with neuroendocrine lung tumors, specifically small cell lung cancer, for which little is known and um, it's not clear how um, what could be targetable in, this, in, in these cases to allow for better treatments. Um, what I'm doing in my lab or in my research profile is um, to work with various layers of analysis, genomic and molecular profiling of human tumors, to work with patient-derived xenograft models to uh, determine tumor cells um, and their functionality in vitro, uh, to make patient-derived in vitro models, but um, uh, as an orthogonal approach, also genetically engineered mouse models have been studied or are available for lung cancer, which allow us to, to perform more in vitro and in vivo studies, and then to adapt the knowledge that we, we gain from these studies to, to the human cancers. This is a different representation again for lung cancer subtypes and neuroendocrine lung tumors has been one of the cases or tumors I've been focusing mostly. Small cell lung cancer is the most frequent one of those and is also the most aggressive lung cancer with a very poor five-year survival rate of less than 2%. These patients are not resectable, um, so the tumors already, already represent at a very uh, highly metastasized uh, stage. And um, the only option is then chemotherapy, which is initially effective, but leads to very, very fast uh, relapse within a couple of months. And that's why um, the, the situation for these patients is very detrimental. What we've done was um, very early on to, to focus on patient cases and to work, work on those very rare cases that are available for these patients and to perform whole genome sequencing at that time when whole genome sequencing was novel and new and applicable for cancer types. And we did that for 110 patient cases at that time, which allowed us to understand more about what is really the genomic alterations found in these cases. In a nutshell, uh, what we do see or what we found was that P53 and RB1 are the most frequently mutated uh, tumors, and it's actually nearly in all patient cases a biallelic loss of those tumor suppressors. So we have classical Knudsen tumor suppressors where uh, the, the biallelic loss of both genes is required for the onset of this disease. 
Additionally, we, we identified a lot of other alterations which fall into the cell cycle deregulation pathway into receptor pyrotyrosine pyokinase pathways, most frequently, though, in the transcriptional regulation where histone modifiers such as crepp 300 are mutated, but also uh, transcription factors like MYC family members are amplified. And uh, as part of the study, we also identified notch mutations, notch as one of the most frequent uh, two, uh, cases to be mutated, and performed further functional studies. So we have found that it's mainly damaging, that the mutation profile is rather damaging, and um, it's mostly enriched in notch 1 and hints at a tumor suppressive role. We performed further functional in vivo studies that I'm not going into in more detail, but what it mainly showed us is that um, notch is actually needed to, to upregulate HES1 and HES1. Uh, hey they counteract neuroendocrine expression. So um, when we have inactivating mutations or downregulation of notch, we have a highly high expression of neuroendocrine markers, which also marks these tumors. And um, we have also DLL3, which is further downregulating this. And that has been always of interest because of uh, therapeutic targets that, uh, that, that, um, that go against the cell surface receptor. And um, they've been um, followed up in various clinical trials uh, in the past years. Um, but what I want to highlight here is that neuron crane marker expression is always regulated by ACO1, one of the transcription factors that uh, determine that. And definitely in small cell lung cancer, we have broadly a downregulation of this pathway. That's why we have a neuroendocrine tumor and a high expression of um, a neuroendocrine markers. The picture is also a little bit more complex with regard to transcriptional heterogeneity. The majority of the cells um, all show a high level of neuroendocrine markers, but opt often observed in tumors is a, a, a balance of neuroendocrine high and neuroendocrine low tumors, and these are all papers focusing on that. So a certain transcriptional heterogeneity that uh, several subtypes can be, um, can be defined or can be found, and the question is, is it really marking a patient subtypes or is it just an intratumor heterogeneity that further drives, it, drives that? Uh, it goes also, in, or digging down more into this field, it goes into the question of what is the cell of origin for lung cancer. And just as a very broad overview, um, for small cell lung cancer, it's believed that neuroendocrine cells are the cell of origin. Adenocarcinomas, which are also frequent lung cancers, are thought to come from AT1 alveolar type 1 cells. And squamous cell carcinomas come from, um, from basal cells of the, of the, that make the lining of the lung. Um, but on the other hand, we also see a lot of trans differentiation. An adenocarcinoma can trans differentiate to a small cell lung cancer, or squamous cell carcinomas can also show mixed morphologies for small cell lung cancer. So it's a really a question in this field to understand is it a distinct differentiation state that gives rise to these tumors, or do we have a lot of cellular plasticity and trans differentiation that happens among those tumor, tumor subclasses um, that we observe also in our cases? So a big question in that regard is always tumor heterogeneity, and that's where um, uh, technologies of single cell sequencing can further aid us to, to understand more about that. So the question we have um, is always how do genomic patterns determine tumor cell plasticity and transcriptional heterogeneity, and how does this term further determine tumor and immune cell, the tumor and immune cell microenvironment? And with that, uh, effort or with that uh, question in mind, we've performed a single cell uh, sequencing on a very large cohort so far of over 60 tumors, where we are one on one hand interested in tumor cell heterogeneity. To, we looked here mainly at patient-derived tumor models, but on the other hand, we are also interested in understanding how tumor cells interact with the immune microenvironment, and that's when we profiled tumor cells and um, uh, immune cells, but directly by um, profiling clinical patient cases. Um, that's an effort which is currently still ongoing, and um, Carlos, who also chairs this session, has been um, heavily interacting with us and, and, and heavily, is actively contributing to this, to this work. Um, I was asked to talk about a little bit of, of those challenges, and the challenges in that regard um, when, when working with tumor samples and with patient material, to have the clinical collaboration and to have the clinical follow-up of these patients. 
Here at the University Hospital in Cologne, we have a very good interaction with the hospital and the clinicians in Cologne, but also in the surrounding areas. And what we've been implementing in the last years was to acquire tumor tissue, which is very rare because patients don't undergo resections usually. So we work with very little material that is acquired through biopsies. And um, at the same time, we also worked with blood uh, samples um, to isolate circulating tumor cells. The tumor tissues we use uh, directly for direct analyses um, on a single cell level. I will get to that in a moment. But at the same time, we are aiming to expand that material by um, implanting that into immune-compromised mice. So that's a, a very nice approach to when we have, you have very limited uh, patient material to expand that further and to, to, under, to understand more and to have more of that tumor material to perform in vitro and in vivo studies, but also genomic studies. We sorted out to circulating tumor cells, which is a, um, a very nice approach because these patients are very, um, present with very aggressive tumors that heavily metastasize. So in the bloodstream, there are a lot of circulating tumor cells. And we've shown that um, they can be captured and, uh, and grafted in, vit in vivo. And uh, we've performed also genomic and functional studies, and they really represent very well what the patient, um, how the patient itself and its tumor are looking like. So we're now then performing transcriptional profiling, but on a single cell level, we opted out to do single cell um, RNA sequencing on viable cells. So um, there are several approaches to perform single cell nuclei sequencing. But at the same time when we started, we wanted to first focus on single cell uh, analysis and um, really working with the RNA that is extracted um, as a processed RNA from the cell tissue. It's a very nice approach, but the caveat here is that you need to process the tumor directly. Whereas when you do genome sequencing or other Approaches. It's fine to acquire the tumor material and freeze it, and then further on work with it later on. But here in the space of single cell uh, analysis, it's extremely important to have a very tight collaboration with the clinics to acquire logistically the tumor within one or two or three, four hours after sample retrieval, to keep the cells in the most viable state, um, to dissociate that into single cells, and then um, to perform further studies, um, which we did here uh, on the 10x genomics platform for single cell analysis. Um, on the one hand, when you have tumor material that you can expand in xenograft models, you have more material, there's less of a logistical restraint um, because you can, um, the, the only logistical restraint is then to, to work with mice and then uh, to have the sample ready um, on the day you harvest or sacrifice the mice to harvest the tumor. But when working directly with patient cases, there's a lot of um, um, logistical tight co coordination needed with the clinicians. Another issue also that came up is that tumor cells often are necrotic. So um, whereas a lot of single cell studies have in the past been performed for normal cells or for normal cell development, it's a bit easier in that moment because it's a healthy cell that is evolving and developing into certain organs. But um, unfortunately with tumor cells, when you, when you receive a material, it, um, it's often very necrotic because tumor cells don't really go for healthy conditions. And there's a lot of uh, cell death ongoing, and easily, even if after, right after retrieval, the cell viability can be less than 70%, which is very harmful for single cell sequencing studies. So um, a lot of material needs to be acquired to go for high cell viabilities, to sort for cells with high cell viabilities, to then have enough material to then perform single cell analysis. All right, um, it was quite of an effort uh, to then acquire these material, but then uh, another effort is, of course, to do the raw data processing. A lot of pipelines have been established in the past years, and we on our own, as part of the computational um, uh, biology group in our department, we've been also establishing our own pipeline together also with Carlos, but also with Milos Nikolic and uh, Martin Pfeiffer. And uh, to then process the data to perform, uh, to get a gene expression output of this and to perform further downstream analysis. What we could see um, in our single cell profiling of direct tumors is that uh, we do uh, obtain um, immune cell subsets and we can further quantify um, the level of immune cells that we can find in patient cases. So this is found here. 
um, where we can uh, we observe macrophages as one of the major uh, type of immune cells that we find in these tumor sites, but also B cells um, and T cells and dendritic cells. At the same time, we go for tumor cell subsets just to look for the level of heterogeneity. And as I displayed at the beginning, we are very much interested in neuroendocrine tumors. There are a bunch of uh, transcriptional factors that have been um, described to, um, to control the neuroendocrine differentiation of these tumors. And what we can see in our cases is the double positivity of several of these, these tumors. So this is on a single cell level. Um, before, when we did bulk sequencing, we believed that um, there's predominantly only one, let's say here ac one tumors are just um, marked by just predominantly one, but the beauty of single cell RNA sequencing revealed to us that uh, we have double positivity for certain of these uh, transcription factors and um, that actually every single tumor harbors the expression of not only one, but several of these uh, factors. And um, this is also displayed here. So this is just one single patient case. Um, it's not just while by bulk sequencing, you would probably assume it's just neuroD1 regulated, as you see here, which is mainly found in most of these cases. But doing single cell RNA sequencing, we can see there's a subset of, tu uh, of tumor cells that exclusively only express ac one but not neuroD1. And that's one of the analysis we're further under trying to understand and decipher what is the interaction of these subsets in these, uh, in these, tum in these tumor pieces that we have sequenced. Um, as said, the clinical data allows us um, to then actually say um, a lot of times people talk about immune deserts and not immune deserts in cancer cells. We can say that it's not an immune desert. As displayed earlier, we see the expression of all these um, immune subsets in these clinical data sets. And this is just uh, repeating again what I showed earlier, um, that mainly macrophages are marking this. Um, what we'd like to do, because single cell RNA sequencing gives us an idea of the cells, but then we would like to go back to the actual 3D organization of these cells. And um, we do that by um, performing imaging mass cytometry, or we're starting to do that. So we go back to the histological slides. We have ideas of uh, what levels of cells we can find. And um, the, the caveat, of course, is uh, when you work with patient material, you don't have so much that you can't do 100, many, or 100 stainings all at, at 100 different sections. So when doing imaging mass cytometry, one can go for a larger panel on just one single section and then go for the marker genes that are found by single cell RNA sequencing then to, to get a spatial resolution where they actually found. This is now for the macrophages. As seen here, we see a lot of macrophages infiltrating. And we do observe now here in these cancer types that they form certain net structures or scaffolding structures, whereas the blue, um, blue uh, uh, stainings here indicate the tumor cells. And um, then it further allows us also to just cluster for or just look at the immune subsets that we have found here and further identify what kind of uh, subgroups we might find. Um, so as said, the interest is to understand how does genomic heterogeneity impact also transcriptional heterogeneity. A lot of single cell approaches currently focus on transcriptional heterogeneity because it's um, much it's best established for single cell RNA. Single cell DNA sequencing approaches are currently um, a bit limited. Um, they are always, it's mainly based on copy numbers or there are, have been recently also with the 10x genomics platform some patent, patent infringements. That's why um, we could not follow up so much on the single cell DNA space. But in general, the question is still, is the tumor cell plasticity that we observe on an RNA level just per se by tumor tumor cell interactions or is there also a genomic component that drives it? And it gets, um, so this is now one overview on the single cell TDNA data, or single cell RNA data that we have generated for uh, to look at tumor tumor cell interactions. And what we observe here in this, in this view of dimensionality reduction where we preserve um, distances and distance properties that we have certain overlapping patient cases and the current effort is to further understand um, what are the cluster of samples. We have patients uh, overlapping, but also cases that cluster together in one area of the SIVAS plot. And what we observed already, if cases that cluster here specifically are somehow linked to MIGN amplification events, where we can further de deduce um, low-level copy number gains and focal high-level copy number gains and understand how that contributes further to the single-cell RNA space. 
Um, while single cell DNA approaches are limited, we also uh, have performed a lot of, um, or we have implemented several computational tools to derive genomic heterogeneity from exome or genome bulk sequencing data. That is mainly only done or best pursued by multi-regional analysis, and we've set up a multi-sample alignment pipeline for mutational clustering. So um, this is now representation where you have a tumor, it starts off with a normal cell, and we have somatic events that are uh, linearly acquired and at some point lead to some branching events. But usually when the tumor is grown, the, the moment we observe the tumor is at this time point when we have all these genomic events, events acquired over time. And um, that's when we sequence it, either by DNA or RNA. And now here on the DNA space, um, it is actually possible to sequence this in bulk and then to go back in time and try to understand what were the events or what is the clonal composition. Um, we do mutation calling, copy number estimation, which is very important for that for that in that regard to then um, determine cancer cell fractions. And with that, we do 2D cluster analysis to then um, decipher the clonal architecture and um, the level of events that first, when, how did it first start and what are the events that later on led to the tumor bulk that we sequenced. This is an example of how that looks like. Um, this is best done with multiple samples acquired over time. We have here a patient uh, who had a primary tumor, was resected, and we sequenced the resected tumor. And uh, at some point later, he unfortunately uh, developed a relapse. We were able to get at these two time points uh, three tumor pieces, one tumor piece at time point T1, two additional tumor pieces at uh, time point T2. We performed exome or DNA sequencing on this to then determine uh, cancer cell fractions and to then uh, compare that to one another and um, then to decipher what are the events and what are the genomic events that come, on, come up later. So when doing this exercise, you see that we have a common ancestor determined by these mutations. We have an acquisition of additional mutations as a linear event here, as a, as a C1 clone that is evolving and a C2 clone that is evolving. And we do see that a certain genomic events that um, are relevant for this cancer type are acquired later on in time. And when we sequence these tumors, this is at this time point, or at this time point, actually, we have a certain level of intertumor genomic heterogeneity. The aim is to, to, um, to, to plot that back to the single cell RNA levels. And um, we've tried to do that for those cases where we can do genomic analysis, but also single cell RNA uh, analysis. This is now a patient case where we were able to work with circulating tumor cells at the time of first diagnosis here, T1. And then at the time of relapse, at the, uh, we required additional tumor material at T2. The genomic analysis allows us to decipher this clonal architecture. So we have a certain C0 clone that further evolves to a C2 clone that is not dominant in the T1. Um, uh, at the T1 tumor one uh, time point here at, uh, at the time of first diagnosis, but at the time of relapse, the tumor is marked by this clone C3. And we have also performed single cell RNA sequencing on these uh, cases. So we have the genome data, we can do a clonal deconvolution. We have the RNA data where we also see a certain, uh, based on the trajectory inference that we've performed, a certain um, yeah, motion from um, the CTC tumor here shown in red at the time of first diagnosis and a CTC tumor um, uh, uh, determined at the time of relapse. And at the moment, we are very much interested to, to map these genomic events to, to the single cell RNA events as good as, it, as we can do with the current technologies to understand how, how genomic events can further drive here uh, the transcriptional heterogeneity. And there are single cell DNA sequencing approaches that we've also tried, but due to patent uh, refringement, we could not further pursue that. This allows us to do copy number analysis. Um, we do cell calling and derive copy numbers from here and um, do uh, cl clustering using resample-based strategies to, you, to look at the data in the TISNI analysis. And there are three distinct clusters that we could identify. And we, um, that was mainly uh, efforts we first initiated um, as part of the Computational Cancer Genomics Group headed by Martin Pfeiffer. Um, we can map that back. So these are the genomic events um, that we can look get out from the single cell data. And um, here it's clear the most common ancestor starts off with, with this genomic copy number profile. 
we have subclone one where a loss of uh, chromosome four is acquired and the subclone two where the cr loss of, um, of chromosome eight uh, again on chromosome eight is acquired and um, when doing bulk sequencing analysis we would have missed c0 and um, and um, c2 because the most abundant um, uh, fraction of cells is represented by clone c1 but the beauty of doing single cell dna allows us to understand that this is an intermediate step here c1 and actually it started off with a tumor that had an initially both uh, copies of chromosome form so this brings me to the end. Um, as an outlook or as a summary, um, we, we, we focus mainly on tumor tumors and um, lung cancer is one of those tumors with an urgent need to look at, to perform deep molecular characterization studies and to have more mechanism-based um, strategies to find better therapeutics for these patients. It's not only lung cancer, there is a wide range of lung can of cancers um, where currently chemotherapy is still the standard of care. and um, there's an urgent need to use really these novel technologies to understand uh, more about the molecular phenotypes and how can we further subdivide patients. Um, they provide us information on the genomics, cell biology, tumor progression, and evolutionary trajectories, which we currently fully pursue. Um, we'll, uh, it's very important actually to, in, on top of that, uh, work with patient samples and patient-derived models to then um, deduce some information from that, but also functionally address that in, in these cases. And uh, what so far the single cell space in, in terms of single cell transcriptome profiling showed us um, that there's a lot of transcriptional plasticity on a tumor cell level, and it's important um, to understand if it's just cell cell communications or cell cycle uh, progression, uh, um, or if it may point to genomic use so that we have an underlying genomic heterogeneity that further de determines the cellular plasticity. And with this, um, that brings me to the end. I would like to acknowledge everyone who has been working with us, most importantly the patients and the collaborating partners at, um, at the clinical sites who have been closely collaborating with us to, to, for this effort to really understand um, these patients. And um, most importantly, I would like to, to, to thank everyone in my group um, who has been working on this, the computational cancer genomics group, who has been very important in, in establishing protocols here with us and, 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 and software and um, data analysis, but also the lung cancer group Cologne, uh, where the clinical uh, coordination has been performed together with the Institute of Pathology. Our external um, collaboration partner, and uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any, any further questions. Yeah. And Julie, right. thank you Bye. so much for sure. a great lecture. You clarified many interesting points for those who plan to work with single cell data here in Brazil. And we have two questions that I would like to raise to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is how important is a multidisciplinary team to work with single cell data? Um, very important, in fact, because um, um, it, it, it is it is in, uh, well, it is extremely important because um, the the one thing is the computation approach and uh, a lot of uh, people are trained as comput uh, computational biologists and they can implement or they can easily implement software run it through and analyze it but at the same time it's not necessary it's also necessary to to be more of a theoretical physicist or a mathematician to, to come up with models because what is this based on? On certain multi computational models are based on, on certain mathematical approaches and, um, and statistical uh, approaches to set this up. So that's, that's, one, that's one set of already interdisciplinarity, but it goes on because then we want to apply it to human cases. And then uh, a lot of biologists and chemists and biochemists come in because um, they have an understanding of molecular mechanisms and cell biology, cell cell communication, and so on and so on, which is also very important. But to go then beyond and to really make a change for a, a patient, one really needs to understand what is the clinical need. Because what even I'm personally uh, trained as a biochemist, um, I'm now working in between with clinicians, but also computational biologists, and it really is important to to understand um, the 
the need on the one hand, because often in, in basic science, you are caught up in a lot of models and are caught up in a lot of mechanisms, which are interesting, but the clinical need is is very apparently something different. So one needs to also communicate very, very much with the clinicians. And at the same time, one needs to also understand what is the discipline really uh, bringing in and what, what are the methods needed. So all in all, it's extremely important because one can run a lot of data analysis, but come up with any gene that you would want to actually, even in cancer, almost every gene is related to, uh, to be contributing to cancer. But um, then to understand and, and dig through and, 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 and go through it, one, one really needs a very multidisciplinary team. Nice. Yeah, I think that yeah. is very important because it, you, you, you can accelerate the, the process and maybe one thing that will take a, lo a lot of time and you can, you can take the help of the math guys and the, the, the program guys and you can accelerate yeah. all the process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have the last question here. Uh, in Brazil, we have very little single cell data being generated. One of the main factors is the high cost of sequencing. On the mm -hmm. other hand, there is a huge amount of data that is generated and made publicly available. I would like to, I, I'd like you to comment on the, import, on the importance of public data in case where it's not possible to generate the data yourself. Well, of course, it's um, extremely important, and it's it's the effort of of all the labs around the world to to create data and make it pub publicly available, um, and um, that's what we've been also doing when once we we, we finished or published a study that it's um, publicly available under controlled access because of because it's patient data, it needs to be under controlled access, but it's publicly available um, following the guidelines that um, no patient infringement is, is follow it, followed up by that, um, but it's just for research or for uh, date, normal data analysis, it's always no problem to, to access the data. And I think that's very important. It's, it's been the approach of the TCGA, of the ICGC, to sequence as many tumors as possible from many different sites, from many things, to then to perform pan cancer or pan pan data analysis and that's that's extremely important to really do so and um, to to make this not just data that is then closed up published but not available but it should be made available because then everyone can access it the other thing is on the other hand though what makes it a little bit difficult is um, is when you have publicly available data it is sometimes hard to judge um, for the TCGA, there's a lot of good control for it and for the ICGC too. But of course, if now um, a certain group somewhere is, is publishing something, they, they do as much as they can in that moment for the, um, for the reviewers and for the, for the editor to provide all information that's available. But if it's not covered then, and um, it's gonna be harder to understand how was the patient really doing? What is the clinical follow-up and so on and so on. That, that makes it, of course, harder. And as part of consortia like the TCGA and the ICGC, it has been very well um, documented and controlled that um, one should have a clinical follow-up. One should know where the data is coming from, what is it made of, what a, how was it sequenced. That's very well um, uh, made. But of course, from if you're not part of this consortium, you, see, you sequence your own data and let's say a group somewhere is publishing something, it makes it harder. Um, and in that moment, of course, the, the contact person or the the author of contact um, should always be available to 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 to, to um, trace back the patients. The sequencing is getting. Um, I also find it extremely uh, crazy how the sequencing prices vary over over just a couple of years. It's a it's a huge effort. Um, that's why um, I. It, and it's 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 a bit hard to afford this as well. I, th I it's um, I find it also crazy, um, and I think it it comes also with a little bit in that moment that companies in certain um, countries, but also companies in certain settings, especially when it's a novel uh, novel approach, so like single cell RNA, where we have had a lot of pitfalls, in fact, due to the limited viability of cells that uh, you can get that uh, offer also discounted prices or um, you know, uh, industry, uh, academia, shared um, um, shared uh, interactions um, to then, you know, that, you know, get the technology out, yeah, so use it in, in our data and then um, and perform some analysis and then so on. 
Yeah. Yeah. I hope I answered that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that we, we we can remember that we have some good some good initiatives like the Chen Zuckerberg initiatives that where mm -hmm. we can get funds and we can submit a project and maybe we can get funds to 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 get money to sequence. And here in Brazil, I think in this year we had the first the first CCI project approved in Sao mm -hmm. Paulo. And I think it's a good option to, yeah. to use here. Yeah. yeah. And then in that moment, I would always uh, go for a very huge interdisciplinary team in that moment. So meaning um, that that's what we've done also, because it is it was not uh, easy to afford certain of these cases. And then we, we made very, very uh, strict uh, quality controls before we performed any uh, sequencing. So um, it has to have a good tumor content. The quality of the tumors needs to be nice. A good clinical follow-up needs to be followed because what happens often is the clinician just takes a sample, here it is, and I said, well, but um, we need also documentation of this patient because then we get a lot of data. There's a lot of effort and, and painful effort even to do the computational analysis and so on and so on. And in the end, you want to relate it back to the patient and then you're missing the information because the patient um, changed the city or <laughs> went on and go somewhere else. And that's why uh, it's important in that moment also to, to, to really logistically think about the cases you go for. Yeah, I think in, in, in addition to, to, to the quality control that we, we don't know what's performed in this data, we have the, 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 the question related to the, what kind of data we will have that is publicly available. For example, in the in the in the in the, in the most of time we have the count count matrix of the mm -hmm. single cell data, but we don't have the the FASTQ data. So we yeah. don't have this because because of the the patient data. But when you have just the count data, you can do some overview analysis and maybe if you want to perform some velocity or if you want to check the RNA velocity of the data, you can, you cannot perform this because you yeah. need the, the, the BAM file. Yeah. Yeah. And, but that, and that should be a, an effort of all the, uh, the journals to make sure that the FASTQ data is deposited. Um, I, I, I understand also the, because it's patient data, it's deposited under controlled access. So it is um, something where you need to make an application. It's a little bit of a, of a um, organizational and um, a, a process you have to go through because you need to have an application, the ethics, uh, the, the IRB um, uh, of the local institution needs to check if it's all fine and then it goes through. So there's a little bit of a time delay, but it's always worthwhile to make these applications because then the data is uh, is accessible and one can download the raw data and perform all the analysis that should be post doable yeah so yeah that's it thank you so much julia again sure. for the great talk and have a good night yeah <laughs> and have a good day Welcome. for all the viewers <laughs> yeah thank you very much thanks for the invitation thank you bye yeah bye